Hey guys, it's XN Shadow, and as you probably know if you follow my Tumblr or Twitter uh, pages, um, I've been playing Bravely Default Flying Fairy for the past couple of weeks. Now, um, you probably know this from before the game came out, but the Bravely Default was one of the games on the 3DS that was I was pretty much most excited for. Um, if I remember correctly, this was one of the first games they showed on the 3DS, and it was basically the first JRPG I saw for the system. Um, and it looked really, really cool, you know? It looked like it was uh, sort of reminiscent of the 8-bit Final Fantasy games, uh, which I enjoy for the most part. I'm not too much of a fan of their more antiquated sort of stylings, but, you know, at their core, I enjoy them um, uh, quite a bit. And, you know, it also seemed to have, like, a really good presentation. Uh, the soundtrack composed by Revo, a.k.a. the dudes who did those two Attack on type Titan openings, which are awesome. You know, um, everything about it just seemed like it was going to shape up and be this, like, amazing, fantastic fucking game, so... You know, the, the wait for it was kind of rough, because it came out in Japan in, like, 2012, and, you know, we didn't hear anything about it coming over to the, to the rest of the world for months after that, although... Eventually, we did find out that they were doing an updated re-release, and then that version was the one that the rest of the world was going to get. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that it, since, you know, since they were making an updated version anyway, I am actually glad that they waited in order to give the rest of the world that better version. So, um, I guess this is like the one instance where I am going to forgive the delay, uh, the, the obnoxious uh, translation delay, you know, because in... In, in this case, it actually ended up in our favor, because instead of buying one version of the game and buying another version, you know, a couple of months later, you know, we just get to buy uh, the, the game once, and you know, that's pretty fun. Um, so yeah, Europe got this game in uh, December, we got this game about two weeks ago, um, I've played through the whole, I've played through the whole thing as of this point, um, I've gotten the true ending, the, the false ending, um, which I'll get into more later. Um, I haven't done all of the post-game and side quest stuff, but I've done a significant amount of it. Um, I believe my play time was something like 78 hours or something like that. Um, so yeah, um, it became basically a full-time job for the entire time I was playing it. So um, yeah, uh, suffice it to say, I really, really liked the game quite a bit. Uh, it's not perfect, mind you. There are a couple of key flaws that keep it from being, like, one of the best RPGs ever. Um, so, I'm gonna, when I talk about the different aspects of the game that I liked or didn't like, I'm obviously going to have to delve into spoiler territory, because, you know, it's an RPG and the story is an important part of it. So, um, uh, before we get too deep into the discussion, this is my spoiler warning right now. It's a good game, RPG fans should definitely buy it. Um, although don't expect a perfect product. Uh, okay, but that's our spoiler warning for now. Uh, everything past this is going to be spoiler territory, so, um, you have been warned. Now, I guess the thing that I should probably talk, uh, about first with Bravely Default is, for me, it's, uh, biggest strength, and that's it, it's combat, you know. Everything involving the combat in Bravely Default is gorgeously designed. It is... Probably, it's one of the best uh, RPG battle systems I've played in in years, basically. Because, you know, it's not anything too too simplistic, um, but it's also not anything obnoxiously complex. You know, actually, if I'm going to be uh, bold enough to say it, I think that this might actually be uh, my favorite turn-based uh, battle system since uh, the Paper Mario games. Um... And uh, considering that, you know, Paper Mario 1 and Paper Mario 2 are some of my all-time favorite games ever, you know, that is about the highest praise that I can give this game ever. It's just like, this is one of the, easily one of the best uh, combat systems I've seen in any RPG ever made. Um, now, the general gist of the combat uh, revolves around the, the tit uh, revolves around the title mechanics Brave and Default. So yes, as dumb as that name is, um, it does actually serve a purpose. It serves two purposes, but I'll, I'll talk about the second purpose later. Um, so yeah, you have two commands in your, uh, in your, in your, you know, your generic fight, run, attack, item, um, uh, fight, you know, item, magic, you know, stuff like that. You have those generic RPG commands, and then you have Brave and Default. Uh, default is your, you know, is basically your defend command. And now, um, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I play an RPG, um, 
I almost never use the defend command unless if it's a super hard game. Uh, the vast majority of RPGs I've played, the defend command is really only there if you need to, um, if you need to pass up the turn for somebody else, uh, basically. Um, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to think of a lot of games, you know, even games that, like, prioritizing tanking, there are usually other abilities that that tank character has that are more useful than just going straight into the defend command. The defend command is usually mostly just a waste of space, with some exceptions, mind you. In Bravely Default, the defend command not only cuts your damage in half for that turn, but it also stores a brave point. Now, uh, brave points are different from your standard hit points and, uh, and magic points, where you start off each fight with zero brave points. Every time you take an action in your turn, you spend one brave point, and at the beginning of the next turn, you get one back. So, if I have one character, and I choose the attack command, and that's it, It'll go down to negative one brave points for that turn after he attacks, and then at the beginning of the next turn, he'll be at zero again and can act. Um, when you default, your brave points will start from zero and then go up to one, and you can do this and store up to three brave points. Now, uh, that's not the, the interesting thing about it. The interesting thing about it is uh, the default command's counterpart, the brave command, which allows you to spend brave points in order to uh, do multiple attacks at once. So let's just say you've defaulted for four turns and now you've got three brave points. Um, now, if you brave uh, three times, you will have zero brave points at the end of the turn, but you will be able to do three actions in that turn. So you will be able to fight, use magic, and heal. Uh, basically, and there's all sorts of different combinations that you could do uh, there. And this is where the game really gets its strategy, because there is a very, very, very large amount of risk-reward here, and that's basically where the game's, uh, like, uh, ta uh, marketing tagline uh, came from, which is something like, uh, dare to risk everything in battle or something like that. Because um, you can also, when you're braving, you don't have to default before you can brave. You can actually brave into negative brave points. Uh, but if you do that, however... You are left wide... If you do that, you know, there's a good chance that you'll be able to wipe out the enemy that you're attacking. You know, if it's just, like, a weak enemy that you've killed a lot of times before. You know, you brave up to max, and then you just smash the attack command. You'll probably be able to kill uh, a weak enemy like that. But, if you don't kill that enemy by then you are left wide open for the amount of turns that you braved until you can get your counter back up to zero. And it just, it's a beautiful system. Especially when you get later in the games and certain special abilities cost brave points to use. It's its so simple. It, it might sound a little confusing when I'm trying to explain it to you, but as soon as you pick up the game, it makes complete sense. Um, the tutorial phase is done in like three minutes. Um, but it's such a beautiful, streamlined, uh, simple system that has so much depth to it, and I love the fuck out of it for that. But that's not where, uh, battles, you know, uh, complexity ends, you know, just we're trying to manage your BP. Um, I haven't played this game, but I'm told that the, that there's a, uh, that, like Final Fantasy V, Bravely Default has a job system. Now, in Bravely Default, you have access to a whole bunch of different uh, jobs or classes that you unlock over the course of the game, most of which by doing side quests. And, you know, there are your pretty... Um, there's a lot of, you know, typical Final Fantasy classes here. You've got White Mage, you've got a Black Mage, you've got a Monk, you've got a Thief, you've got a Knight, you've got a Red Mage. You know, you've got a lot of the traditional classes there, but... Uh, as you, you know, as you, uh, go on, you unlock a lot more weirder classes, like a merchant, or a vampire, or performer, or, and stuff like that, and each, uh, each, um, each, uh, class that you get, like I said before, you get them by doing side quests, you know, each one gives each individual character their own unique, um, uh, costume, and a lot of them are really, uh, are really adorable, too, so, um, yeah, the the job system's there, and, you know, like a lot of other games with this feature, you can sort of mix and match jobs. Each one has its own little different things that are good and bad about it. So, like, you know, White Magic has better mind, but doesn't do as good physically, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, what's also interesting is, is that you can also put in a secondary command from a different job. So, you can have a White Mage 
with monk abilities or a dark knight with uh with performer abilities and stuff like that so you can get some really messed up combinations that are awesome and on top of that you also have a couple of spots for different support abilities that you get as you level up the job so like for example i forget what level it is but early on the white mage unlocks an, a support ability that will occasionally allow her to get her damage cut in half when hit by an enemy attack you can equip that onto your um, character, and it'll happen no matter how, uh, no matter what class she is, or what, well, what class he or she, your character is, or what abilities, uh, what secondary ability that person has. So you can have a black mage monk with uh, white magic support abilities, and it's just amazing how much customization you can have in this. And um, thankfully, unlike the demo, because this is one thing that bo bothered me about the demo, uh, is that in the demo, you are just bombarded with classes, and it takes like a half an hour to just set your party up. Unlike the, the demo, the game introduces the different jobs to you at a st slow but steady enough rate that you aren't overwhelmed by everything over uh, at all at once. The tutorial process is quick and streamlined. Um... But it's also really well done, and it's just great. I love the combat to it. But, you know, stuff doesn't even stop there, too. Um, there's a lot of social media aspects to... Well, not social media, because you can't, like, connect your Facebook account to it or anything. But there's a lot of social aspects to Bravely Default. Uh, one of which being Norende Village, which is like a little mini-game where you take street passes um, that you get. And you uh, assign, and you know, each time you street pass by someone, you get a villager for the villa, uh, for the village, and you're trying to rebuild it back up because, uh, for plot reasons, one of the main characters, Tiz, his village is destroyed at the beginning of the game, and you're trying to rebuild it. Um, but you can use the people you street pass to build certain things. Like you can put a villager on a shop, and then then once the villager finishes building the shop, you'll be able to buy swords from the uh, save point guy. And now the thing is, is that if you have one villager working on one task, the task will take like three hours to complete, for example. And this is, happens if you're playing the game or if you have the game in sleep mode. So you can do a lot of Norende Village um, building just by turning the game into sleep mode when you go to bed for the night. Uh, but let's say you have one villager, one task that takes three hours. If you put that one villager on that one task, it'll be done in three hours. Now let's assume that you have two villagers. If you put those two villagers on that same task, it will be done in one and a half hours. Or you could put that other extra villager on a different three hour task and get both of them done at the same exact time. So, you know, it's a it's an interesting system. And while I got Norinde Village uh, finished before I even reached the halfway point of the game, uh, depending on how much uh, street passes you have available to you, if you um, abuse the save uh, the the street the uh, Norinde Village glitch in the demo, um, or any other number of factors, you could get finished with Norinde Village faster or slower than I have. So uh, in the end, it's an interesting little mini game too, because uh, you know you get a lot of really really good gear. Uh, for from Norende Village, especially late game. And not only that, uh, Norende Village is where you get uh, special move parts. And to make a long story short, basically it's stuff that allows you to make your own limit breaks, which is again, another amazing feature that is so much fun. And the social stuff doesn't stop there, too. You can also um, summon, uh, summon, if you have friends registered on your 3DS, you can summon your friend's attacks. So, like, let's say your friend's been playing the game ahead of you, and he has, like, a level 99 knight or whatever. And if he choose, Oh, excuse me. Um, If he chooses the send command when he has his knight do his super awesome sword attack, that'll do 999 damage. Um, When you... Uh, summon him, he'll also do that 9999 damage, or whatever. And that can be really great if you've got a friend that's playing ahead of you. Um, now, it, it, that ability might sound somewhat broken, but it's sort of mitigated by the fact that you can only summon a friend once per, each friend once per day. So, that helps a lot. Unless if you've got, like, 50 friends who have all beaten the game or something like that. Um, another, uh, thing, uh, social thing that happens is that there's a feature called the Ablink feature, which basically means that you can link your characters to your, the characters from your friend's playthrough of the game. So, if you've been raising Tiz, for example, as a white mage, and you want him to have certain abilities from the monk class. If your friend has been playing Tiz as a monk, you can uplink your Tiz to his Tiz, and then you have all of his monk skills. And that's just, 
the game makes it so convenient to try out different uh, job system type stuff, you know. Uh, there's obviously going to be some trial and error, you know, to these sorts of systems, because you got to work through what uh, combinations do, do and don't work. Uh, but, you know, the game really streamlines that process and tries to make it as easy as possible for you to have fun and go wild with, uh, with job combinations. And it is incredibly possible to get some ridiculously broken combinations. Like, um... I found, uh, like, there's simple stuff. Like, for example, you get a class relatively early on called the Spell Fancer, and he allows you to attach different, um, uh, element, uh, different magic spells to your sword. So, like, you can attach the fire spell to your sword, and now your sword will do extra damage to enemies that are weak to fire. That's relatively straightforward. There's also a spell called Drain, which will drain the enemy's health. You attach that to your sword, uh, to your, uh, you use the Spell Fencer, the Drain spell on your swords with the Spell Fencer, and then every attack you do will drain that much health from the enemy, so then that character basically never has to worry about health anymore. That's a relatively simple uh, combination that you'd probably find pretty quickly. There are other, there are some that are take a little bit more uh, finding though. Like for example, there's combining different uh, two different characters in different classes to get a really cool effect. Like for example, around the, uh, uh, later on in the game, you get classes called the ninja and the the swordsmaster. The swordmaster is all about countering enemy attacks. So, you know, they have all sorts of different abilities that'll allow them to do a counterattack, like when an enemy does magic on them, or when an enemy does um, a physical attack on them, or stuff like that. The ninja is all about trying to determine where the enemies hit. So, you know, uh, they have, like, a whole bunch of evasion uh, boosting abilities and stuff like that. But the ninja also has an ability called Kairai, which will make all of the enemies attack one specific character for that entire turn. You use Kairai to make the enemies target the, the Swordsmaster, and you have the Swordsmaster set up one of his co uh, counterattacks, and you can do ridiculous damage against everything that way. And it's just an amazingly... And also, if you comb if you have that uh, Swordsmaster... Um, and have the spell fencer as the as its support uh, as its secondary ability. You can have drain on him. So basically, that swordsmaster will be healing itself from the attacks every time he counters, making it a, a, a an amazingly wonderful combination. It's just you, there are dozens of tactics like that where you can just utterly break the game in half, and it's just so much fun to do. But the game uh, com compensates for that by being actually legitimately difficult. Like, you know, you have tons of broken uh, abilities and combos that you can do, but you'll need them, because the game is just uh, that well designed, and the bosses are tough, but relatively fair most of the time. If there's one thing that I had to um, complain about when it comes to the boss fights is that a lot of them are basically a, you go in once, knowing you're going to lose, then you'll know the enemy's strategy and you can prepare um, for the fight afterwards and win the second time. That's my only real complaint about it because I'm not really a big fan of boss fights that, um, uh, that you know, force you to lose the first time so that you can figure out what's going on. I feel like you should be able to win, um, you know, the first time you try. But since the, the game is really trying to push strategy, I'm going to give it a pass on that for the most part. Uh, my only real big complaint is, is that, um, you know, it's just a little bit frustrating because the boss fights can go on for a while. You know, sometimes they can reach like 10, 20 minutes. So, you know, you could be doing pretty well on that first try, even tr when d uh, even if you hadn't properly prepared for the boss's specific attacks. And then you'll lose and you have to do the entire thing all over again. And while it might be easier now that you know what you need to do, it's still frustrating. But again... That's a relatively minor nitpick. Um, have I forgotten anything else when it comes to the... Oh, yeah, the, 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 the microtransactions. Uh, this is something that people have been getting into a huff about, uh, is the microtransaction aspect of Bravely Default. And since microtransaction is one of those like buzzwords that will immediately get people talking, I'm, I understand that, but calm your tits, everybody. It's not that big of a deal. Basically, um, in the game, you have an ability called Bravely Second, which happens when you press the pause button. And basically what happens is, is that you stop time for a moment and your characters can, um, can do an action, any action, even if they're on negative brave points. Um, so I, most of the time when I used this ability, it was basically just, you know, for really quick healing when the boss is about to wipe us all out. But... 
The thing here is, is that, uh, in order to use Bravely Seconds, you need to use SP, or Sleep Points. Now, you can accumulate uh, Sleep Points by putting the, the game in Sleep Mode for 8 hours. And so, you'll usually, if you put the game in Sleep Mode before you go to bed for the night, you'll usually get one day. Or something like that. And, you know, I don't mind that either, because you also uh, build Morende Village during that time. So, um... Yeah, it, it, that generally works out uh, for me. I don't mind that. What bothers people, though, is is that you can also buy SP in the form of SP drinks from uh, the from with real money from the eShop. And um, I think each SP drink you buy is like a buck. Um, it'll completely refill your store of SP. Um, I actually didn't buy one, but that's only because the first SP drink you buy is 50 cents, and I had like 51 on my um, account at that point. So, you know... Why the hell not, right? Um, but again, it's, besides that one time it, for that one what the hell factor, um, I never felt the need to buy SP drinks, really. I mean, it's a little bit annoying when you're at minimum SP to see the, the SP light flash like that, but it's easily an ignore, ignorable feature. You don't need to use it. The game isn't designed around it. You know, there aren't too many boss... Again, since the boss fights really revolve around strategies involving, you know, job systems and equipment and uh, accessories and stuff like that, there aren't an awful lot of bosses where, you know, you need to spam the SP button in order to win. So it, it's not really a pay-to-win sort of feature. Or at least, if you did pay-to-win that way, you'd probably be spending, like, a, a thousand bucks to beat the game. So, yeah, um... I guess you could do that if you wanted to, um... I don't know why you'd want to, though. I mean, on its face, the Bravely Second feature is an alright uh, mechanic. It's it's named the the name Bravely Second is also the name of the sequel, and it was a mechanic designed for the sequel that they brought back for the reworking of Bravely Default One that we got. Um, you only get like four Bravely Seconds before you run out, though, if you're at max. So you know, I'm hoping that in the sequel they like give you more of them without microtransactions, please, um, and that it becomes a more central mechanic because it, it's kind of throwaway the way it is. But again, it doesn't hurt anything by being there, and it saved my ass a lot of time, so I don't have an issue with it. But yeah, um, I know that the microtransaction thing might irk a lot of people, but for me, I didn't really have a problem with it. But it's just, uh, the combat is easily the best part of the game, and it's amazingly well- Okay, I'm not gonna say easily the best part of the game, because I'm gonna get into the other part of the game that I love just as much, the presentation. Oh my god, this is a gorgeous game. This is one of the best games, looking games, on the 3DS. It is absolutely mind-blowing how spectacular this looks, in both a- a technical and an artistic sense. Um, if you want uh, the artistic um, uh, depiction of it, just go look up Bravely Default screenshots uh, in like Google Images or whatever. And it, it oh my God, the art is just gorgeous. Uh, it's 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 hand painted. It's pre rendered. It's a pre rendered background, but it's also a modern day pre rendered background. So it looks like it looks like a watercolor painting. And it is just one of the most beautiful looking games on the 3DS. It's just Oh, it's like it's environment porn. That's uh, the base, the way I can put it best. It is just absolutely gorgeous uh, environments, and I love them to death. I also like the character models too. You know, they're nice and smooth. You know, uh, there's some minor clipping issues, but that'll happen in any game with inter interchangeable, um, interchangeable costumes. And you know, the the it's not just the, the art though. It's just like the, all the textures are really well done. All the models are smooth and high poly. And there's gorgeous lighting effects. Like um, in certain areas, there'll be light coming through the windows. And if you walk the character through the light, the light will actually like shine on the character until he walks out of the. Ri it's oh my god! It's so it. I, I know I'm gushing here, but it's just an absolutely gorgeous game, and I love I love the way it looks to death. Um. Also amazing, the soundtrack. My god, this is one of the best soundtracks I have heard in years. Uh, there are... There are dozens of fantastic tracks. And now, if I had to make one complaint about the soundtrack, I would like a little bit more track variety. I think there's like something like 40 tracks for an 80-hour game, so... um, You're going to be hearing each individual song a lot, but... They are such well-composed tracks... I don't even care. 
I could go on for hours talking about how much I love uh, the battle theme, Bells of Battle, the uh, the mini boss theme, Fighting to the End, the main boss theme, He of the Name. Um, every single town theme is fantastic. The world map theme does this really cool thing where the melody will change as uh, from day to night. Um, airship music spectacular. All three of the final boss themes amazing. The dungeon themes so so good. This is just one of the most fantastic soundtracks I've heard in a long, long time, and it's going to be one of my new all-time favorites for sure, which is kind of kicking me in the ass a little bit because I was writing a script for a video on my top 20 game soundtracks list, and now I have no idea what to do about Bravely Default because I started writing that before I played the game, so yeah, um, that's something. But, oh my god, this is... If you have the time... Uh, they actually have a live concert of Link to Horizon playing music from the game. And uh, the, there's also a lot of vocal rearrangements of the... Tr it's just amazing stuff. You should... If you type in Bravely Default Concert, it's one of the first things that'll pop up. And it's just... It is... It is a must-watch. It is absolutely fantastic. I love the soundtrack of this game to death. Um... I have a hard time picking a favorite song, honestly. It's just there are so many good tracks. Um, man, I could go on about that. I could go on about that forever. Um, I, I've, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, now if you're wondering about the plot, um, uh, what you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of this that there would be plot spoilers. Um, and I guess I should probably bring up the spoiler warning again now because I'm actually going to start talking about it a little bit. Um, I'm saving the plot to last because really. It is one of Bravely Default's weaker aspects, unfortunately. Um, not that it's bad by any means. Like, I've seen my share of bad game plots, and this is not one of them. It is not bad, but it definitely could have been better. Um, I'll, I'll start with the positive aspects of the game's story, uh, first off. Character interactions are great. I love the characters to this game. Uh, the main four uh, characters, Tiz, Agnes, um, Adia, and Ringabel, all have great chemistry. And my favorite moments of the game, uh, plot-wise, are basically when they're just uh, uh, fucking about, you know, doing whatever, you know. Um, the, the characters bounce off each other well, and the writing is often really funny. Uh, which I appreciate, because, you know, uh, humor... I play games to have fun, and humor is just... Any game with a good sense of humor automatically gets bonus points for me. But uh, there are a lot of par party chat uh, sequences uh, similar to those in the Tales of series. Um, or, you know, well, they'll just talk about stuff like... Um, uh, like Adia making on, uh, Ring a Bell carry her bags for... Uh, her bags for her when he needs to, when she's going shopping, or, you know, Adia going, talking about how the correct way to say fashionable is fashionable. And, you know, the, 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 the writing in those sections is, uh, consistently hilarious. And most of the dialogue is actually fully voice acted, too. And while the, the, the VA is hit or miss at a lot of points, like, I love Spike Spencer as Ringabel. He is one of my new favorite characters just for that. Um, you know, and a lot of the the sub like the 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 bosses have great VA too. Um, Tiz and Anya, I'm a little less eh, on. You know, their voice is kind of uh, great on me. But the game does have an option to switch to the Japanese um, voice track, so you can use that if you want. And I just gotta say, it is impressive how much stuff that they managed to to put into this uh, into this game. You know, because on top of being absolutely gorgeous. They managed to... The, almost every single line in the game is voice acted. So they managed to stuff an entire uh, epic-length RPG's uh, voice acted sound, uh, voice acting in there twice for two different languages. That's 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 impressive. Um, but yeah, um, the, the, the character moments, I think, are really well done. I love those aspects. The actual plot is a different story. It's not... Again, it's not bad. It is definitely not bad, but there are parts of it that are frustrating. Um, in that, early on, there's a lot, no, not just early on, there's a lot of filler. That's, um, that's the the biggest issue with Bravely Default's plot, is, is that there is a ton of filler. And, for the most part, this filler could have been, um, could have been cut out, or, not even cut out, but just, like, one or two lines could have changed, and it wouldn't have been filler anymore. And, you know... 
And that frustrates me. Like, for example, early on in Chapter 2, there is um, there's a sequence where you're trying to go restore the crystals because, you know, this is all playing homage to the early Final Fantasy games, and you did that a lot there. So you're going to the second crystal, and it's the water crystal. And then there's this shield up um, above the crystal that is preventing us from uh, doing anything about it for the moment. And... Uh, you find out that the shield was being uh, generated by an old friend of Agnes's. Now, there's a line there by one of the characters saying, uh, I think Aerie it was, the, like your little support helper fairy person, who we'll talk about later. Um, she says something like, Okay, Agnes, you should get rid of the shield now. And then Agnes says, No, I want to go find Olivia first. Uh, for uh, no good reason, really. Well, I mean, there is a good reason. It, it's It's shown that they're friends and that they miss each other and that she wants her advice and yada 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 so Agnes has her reasons but the whole saving the crystals thing is like the the point that we're going on the quest at this moment so like logically it makes no real sense why Agnes doesn't spend a few hours getting rid of the shield and um and uh and awakening the crystal before they you know find Olivia they can always do that later um this could have easily, and then the thing is, is that um, you spend like the rest of the the chapter trying to find Olivia, and when you get to the end, uh, the end, and you find her, she ends up getting killed, which drops the shield anyway. So, it this could have been made not filler just by changing one line and changing from Agnes could just uh, could stop the shield herself to we need to find Olivia to let, put down the shield. These shields are never really brought up again. It's just a background detail as to why the bad guys don't mess with the crystals as soon as we leave. You know, it's just, you know, techno babble. So, you know, it you didn't have to bring that up. You could have changed it easily, and it wouldn't have been filler anymore. And that's just frustrating uh, to me, because it, it's, it's just such a writing oversight that, you know, sort of bothers me. Um... A more egregious example, however, ends, happens towards the end of the game, and now this is where the major spoilers start coming in, so if you've been ignoring my warning up to this point, click off now if you don't want to be um, a spoiled for endgame stuff, but it turns out that Aerie, your support uh, creature fairy dude, was actually evil the whole time, and that actually um, ends up doing a really cool thing to the title screen once you figure it out. Where the title, the the subtitle will go from "Where the fairy flies" to uh, jet, all of the extra di um, letters will uh, sort of fade away, and then the title screen will just say "Airy lies." And I thought that that was so cool when I first saw it. But you find out that Airy is um, evil, and that. Uh, she's trying to get you to awaken the crystals to do something bad. You're not sure what the bad thing is yet, but you know that she's up to no good. Um, and you're doing some, like, dimension hoppy type stuff. I I'm not going to get too into the details at this point, but you're doing some dimension hoppy type stuff, and it's requiring you to go back to the temples over and over again, finding the same temple guardian bosses in order to awaken the crystals every single time, and you have to repeat the process, like, four extra times if you want to get the real ending, and that's obnoxious, because there is some plot development that happens a little bit, but... It's spread off across four different chapters, and you could have chopped, you could have put it into two, easily. Now, what sorta um, saves this is that every time you enter a new chapter in the late game, you get a whole new uh, batch of side quests where you get further character development on all the old bosses, and you know they remix some of the boss fights too, where you know you'll be fighting them in different combinations, and you can steal some different loot from them, and that I think is pretty cool, but. You know, um, if you're just trying to, if it's, it gets repetitive and frustrating, and the last third, you know, chapters five through eight, is easily the weakest part of the game, and now, thankfully, as early as chapter five, you can, uh, do a specific thing and skip straight to the normal ending, which is, uh, like your bad ending, and I've played through the normal ending, it's uh, kind of unsatisfying, and, but even if you do want to go straight for the true ending, you can, if you ignore all the side quests, and you, like, turn off encounters, um, you turn off random battles, which you can do, actually, which I think is another really great thing, because you can either turn off your random encounters or max them, ma or, or double them, so if you want to avoid grinding or do lots of grinding, so, that's pretty cool, um. But, you know, if you turn off encounters, set your battle animation to times four, uh, you can get through uh, the last couple of chapters in just a few hours, so 
it's not that bad, but it's definitely a brick wall to the pacing, and it's something that I think could have been fixed easily. Um, you know, you chop out two chapters by then, because there's really only two sets of um, interest, uh, new boss fights anyway. Like, chapters 5 and 6 share uh, boss fights. Chapters 8 in the final uh, chapter share the boss fights. Chapter 7 has its own unique boss fights for some reason, though. So what I would have done is I would have chopped two of the chapters. I would have had chapter 5 have its own uh, have its sub-bosses, you know, in the way it is. Chapter 6 have the chapter 7 sub-bosses, and have chapter... The final chapter have the it the same bo sub bosses that his have it has, uh, but the sub bosses are all the the old like uh, side quest bosses that you would have fought from chapters one through four. Um, every time, still, you would have ended up fighting the same uh, temple guardians over and over again. So what I would have done is I would have had you fight those same guys again for like the the first run through, um, and then the game would give you and then I'd have the game give you the option to go to the normal ending there. But if you decide to do another run through the cycle, I would have put new bosses at the temples to make the the back tracking way less tedious because I could basically fight uh, those four t uh, sub bosses uh, blindfolded now it's it, it's ridiculous um but yeah that ending is it, it wasn't enough of a of a of a pace breaker to get me to stop playing the game but I went from playing like uh from playing like all at once to just doing like short spurts at that point it was a it was a huge pace breaker and it's something that i hope that they don't um repeat in the sequel um uh, that's i think something a uh, positive i could uh, say about it is is that thankfully there's going to be a sequel to this game where they can you know tighten up that the story aspects because you know despite the the filler there is a lot of really great story points uh, to this game. Not just, like, character interactions, but story points, too. And the game doesn't treat you like an idiot. You know, there's enough foreshadowing and background details for you to piece together different um, uh, uh, plot points ahead of time. Like, you can guess that Aerie is evil beforehand just by paying attention to her dialogue. Even before Chapter 5, where it starts to get more obvious. Like, you know, in Chapters 1 through 4... You know, she tries to masquerade as your uh, generic uh, helpful fairy, but she comes across as kind of a sociopath at points, and it's something that I look back in hindsight and thought, yeah, that is weird. But, you know, it's not something that's, you know, blunt force trauma into your brain, um, you know, so to, too much to the point where it's, like, obvious to everyone, you know? Uh, you're given this thing called uh, Dee's Journal where there's a lot of this background information, and, you know... If you go out of your way to read that, you know, a lot of this stuff will be a little bit more clear to you, but that's all optional reading. If you're playing, even if you're just playing through the game normally, you can piece together some of the stuff. Or you might not, and you could be completely surprised. The game doesn't treat you like a moron and spell out its symbolism or spell out its foreshadowing or any of that crap. And I am so grateful that this, uh, that this, that this game treats its player with a modicum of intelligence, and I just love that. Um, so yeah... Flawed as it might be, I still enjoyed the game's story. Yeah, the the padding, the relentless padding, especially in chapters four through eight, is really what might be a make it or break it uh, deal for a lot of people. You know, I can understand it being like a game wrecking issue for some people. I know uh, one person on a forum that I go to, uh, Beg, if you're listening, hi there, um, who had a much harsher take on the later half of the game than I did. So, you know, I can understand if other people, um, if some of you guys have a, have a, have a more negative, uh, approach to the second half of the game, but for me, I didn't think it was enough to, um, to ruin my effect on the game, because even still, even with all the backtracking and all the padding, you still get some new character bits, you know, if you're going out of the way for the side quests, a lot of those get new dialogue, and that's a lot of fun. And again, the battle system is just so much fun that, you know, to some extent, not completely, but to some extent, I don't mind fighting the bosses over and over. So, yeah, um, I guess I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, for RPG fans, for, uh, 3DS owning RPG fans, I would say that this is definitely a must buy, despite its flaws. Uh, it would probably get like an eight and a half uh, out of me. It's a great game, and I loved playing it to death, um. It's just those niggling flaws, you know. It, that That's, like, it's not, like... I think it's just frustrating to me more than anything, because, you know, with those flaws taken care of, this could have easily skyrocketed in, it into being one of my, like, all-time favorite games. So I think that's, um... Uh, 
part of it. You know, my own hype and uh, the the game's different flaws have sort of ended up having this game that could have been so much uh, could have that is already great, but could have been so much better. And that's I think the the frustrating aspect of it. But still, even so. I still recommend it to any RPG fan on the 3DS. If you're not an RPG fan, then I'd be a little bit more wary because, you know, it does do a lot of RPG tropes that, you know, a lot of people might have issues with. You know, there's still random battles, there's still anime-style cutscenes, you know. There's still stuff like that. If you don't like RPGs, I don't think this is going to be the game to change your mind. But, for people who already like the genre, I, I say it gets a hearty recommendation. Uh, just uh, make sure that you're prepared for that la later half of the game if you want to go for the true ending. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, that's about it. Um, I think the next time I'm going to do one of these, it's going to be for Tales of Symphonia Chronicles, because I'm going to be picking that up on Tuesday, so I get to avoid the RPG la uh, the RPG post-game uh, depression this time. Woo! Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's about it for me. I'm X and Shadow, and I'll see you guys later.